All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Debbie Schnorr, and I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator for the University of California Cooperative Extension. And I'm also a master gardener, a master food preserver, and master composter. And thank you for joining this Zoom presentation about composting and organic waste recycling. And I'm going to um, stop my video right now before we start. All right. Okay, so first we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and we'll put it up on our, um, on our YouTube channel shortly. And uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go in the chat and I'll uh, answer the questions at the end of each section. And then uh, please turn off your cameras to save bandwidth and uh, keep your mic on mute uh, when it's not in use. And if you wanna see the slides and video of this presentation, um, you can go to our website, website mgsb.ucanr.edu and go to recent presentations. And we'll be putting some links in the chat. Sharon's gonna help me here by being my co-pilot and if you wanna save them, you can um, do that by um, clicking on the three dots in the chat box and then clicking on save chat, or uh, you could also cut and paste from the chat box. All right, first a few words about um, Master Gardeners of San Bernardino County. Um, we're part of the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources Division, UCANR. And um, as trained volunteers, uh, we share peer-reviewed evidence-based scientific research from the University of California and other trusted sources. And we give presentations, workshops, classes uh, on a wide variety of topics, including composting, sustainable landscaping, and seed saving. And uh, Master Gardeners is also part of the UC Cooperative Extension. And that is a collaborative program between um, the university and each county. Um, and each county has um, their own programs. In San Bernardino County, we have expanded the Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program, FNEP. We have the 4-H Youth Development Program, uh, Master Gardeners and Master Food Preservers. And we also have academic advisors in um, different areas like natural resources and horticulture. And we also have a relatively new program, the Environmental Education Program. And our mission is to promote uh, environmental awareness, understanding and sustainable practices. And we've been focusing on um, several different areas over the past few years, uh, composting, waste reduction and recycling and food preservation as it applies to um, food waste reduction and hydroponics. Uh, we loan hydroponic systems to schools. Um, we also help with uh, to start and maintain uh, composting sites. And um, that's part of our composting quick start program. Uh, also perform food waste audits for schools and organizations. And we can give presentations um, and workshops on uh, a wide variety of environmental topics. And just in case you didn't know, uh, we do have a uh, regional uh, seed library in San Bernardino run by the Master Gardeners. And our mission is to share donated and community shared seeds with the public. And we have two locations, uh, which are pop-up seed libraries. One is at the Highland Library on the second Saturday of the month. And the other is at the Ontario Library at the third Saturday of the month. And you'll also find uh, free in-person and online 
uh, classes on seed saving on our website. And before we get into uh, the topic of our presentation, I'd like to do two public service announcements, uh, one about citrus greening disease and the other about the oriental fruit fly. So um, for citrus greening disease, um, there are quarantine areas in San Bernardino, Riverside, Los Angeles, uh, San Diego and Ventura counties, uh, all throughout uh, Southern California. And the disease is caused by bacteria that's spread by an insect called the Asian citrus psyllid. And uh, it is fatal to all citrus trees. It will kill them within 10 years of uh, being infected. And right now there is no cure. So it's really important that everybody work together to help prevent the spread of the disease. And you can do that by not sharing stems and leaves when you share citrus um, uh, from your trees uh, and not sharing any cuttings at all from citrus trees. Uh, keeping ants out of your trees because they protect uh, the Asian citrus psyllid. Um, for its um, for the honeydew, uh, the sweet sap that it produces, and then also tell everyone you know um, about uh, about citrus screening disease. And then um, the oriental fruit fly. Um, this is a pest that's uh, recently come to our area. Um, it, there's quarantine in San Bernardino and Riverside counties, uh, including Redlands, Yucaipa, Highland, San Bernardino and Riverside. And we're gonna talk about this later uh, with regard to how it affects composting and it uh, attacks many crops in um, California, including uh, fruits, uh, nuts, vegetables and berries. And um, it, it has a very short life cycle and that can cause it to spread very quickly. And if you're living in a quarantine area and you should hear from the CDFA or your city, if you are, uh, you should not move homegrown fruits and vegetables from your property. And if you do wanna dispose of this produce, you should double bag it in plastic bags and uh, put it in your black landfill trash bin, not the green bin. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, so uh, today's topic, we're gonna start with um, uh, Senate Bill 1383, and that is the law that governs organic waste recycling. And then we'll talk about how to sort your organic waste, uh, including food waste. Uh, and then next up is home composting and we'll cover uh, things like the basic ingredients, uh, the process, best practices, systems and tools. And then finally we'll cover uh, how to compost in an oriental fruit fly quarantine area. And as I mentioned, um, I'll be uh, stopping at the end of each topic for Q and A. Okay, so let's start with Senate Bill 1383, uh, also known as SB 1383. And I want to acknowledge Cal Recycle for providing the next few slides that explain uh, what it's all about. So Senate Bill 1383 was passed to address organic waste, which is the largest waste stream in California. And if you look at the pie chart, uh, the, the, uh, on the right side is the organic waste in, in yellow. And you can see that's 52% of the waste stream. That's a little more than half. And that includes uh, green waste, wood waste, uh, food waste, and paper. And um, you can see that uh, food waste is 13% of our organic waste. And that means more than 6 million tons of food waste is thrown in the landfill every year. And at the same time, about 20% of Californians don't have enough affordable, healthy food. So SB 1383 addresses this problem by requiring the state to recover a portion of disposed edible food to feed people in need. Oops. 
So I think we all can um, see that climate change is negatively impacting California. Uh, we have rising sea levels, uh, reduced snowpack. And from where I sit in Rancho Cucamonga, if I look north to the mountains, in fact, I don't see any snow on top of the mountains this year, which is pretty unusual. Um, we've had somewhat of a wet uh, year, um, a wet fall. Uh, so we haven't had uh, as many wildfires as we've had before. Um, and the drought is um, at least reduced for now, but uh, we are certainly seeing the heat waves and um, this winter has been a little bit uh, warmer than usual. But when we throw organic waste in the landfill, um, that emits methane gas, which is a very powerful pollutant that's um, more potent than, um, than uh, carbon dioxide in causing climate change. So uh, SB 1383 aims to keep that organic waste out of the landfill and reduce methane. So SB 1383 was adopted way back in 2016. Uh, but the regulations didn't take effect until January 1st of 2022. And this year, 2024, uh, they are being enforced at the local level. Um, looking forward, the law requires that California reduce its landfilled organic waste by 75% by 2025, and that's compared to 2014 levels. Um, it also requires a 20% increase in edible food uh, recovery. So currently um, there's a lot of good food in restaurants and schools that's being thrown away. And um, hopefully some of that food uh, can uh, be redistributed. Now, um, According to SB 1383, cities and other areas are required to um, provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. And they can choose the um, type of collection service that works uh, best for their area. So you've probably seen some changes to your waste collection over the past few years. And depending where you live, you could have a three container, a two container, or a one container service. So in the three containers, which is probably most common in the bigger metropolitan areas, um, the blue containers used for recyclables, the green container uh, for green waste and food waste, and the black or gray for landfill, which is everything else. And that requires um, you as the customer to sort everything before collection, although it is sorted again once, once it um, gets uh, to uh, the uh, waste station. Um, in the two and one container service, um, the mixed waste is, uh, there, the waste is mixed and it's sorted uh, after collection or at least part of it. Um, so, uh, for these two types of services, you're either paying at the front end, uh, as in the three container service, to have the system to be able to collect all these different kinds of ways, or you're paying at the back end of sorting it after it's been collected. So before we move on, um, are there any questions about um, SB 1383? And you can either put those in the chat or go off of mute. Okay, well, if anything comes up, uh, feel free to put it in the chat. So we'll just, we'll move on. So let's look at um, how to sort waste for a three container collection service. And this is just an example uh, from Burtec, which is uh, the waste company for Rancho Cucamonga. And it may, you know, your waste service, even if you have a three container service may um, differ, you know, depending on who your waste company is, but this just gives you an idea. 
So for instance, um, let's talk about the three kinds of bins. So for the black landfill trash bin, uh, some of the things that can go in there are snack bags, and those uh, contain kind of a laminate of metal foil and plastic that can't be easily separated. Um, also ceramics, uh, broken or not, because uh, those are not going to break down. Um, disposable diapers, uh, toothpaste tubes, which contain a variety of plastics. Um, gloves, vinyl, or nitrile, or um, plastic, and then styrofoam. So these are things kind of forever waste that are not going to uh, break down. They're going to stay in the landfill for a long, long time. And then we have the blue recycling bin. And so in that bin, you can put all kinds of paper, um, and I just want to preface this with um, the items that go into recycling should be clean before you put them in recycling. So paper like paper bags, um, um, cardboard, newspaper, mail, um, also uh, glass like glass bottles and glass jars. Uh, different kinds of plastics, whether it be a plastic bottle or a plastic food container. And if you look on the right side here, you know, on the plastics, you're going to see this um, recycle, the chasing uh, arrows symbol, and it usually has a number in the middle. And the um, items with a lower number are typically easier to recycle. Um, but I would recommend just taking anything, you know, just because that um, an item has that symbol on it doesn't mean that it actually really truly is recyclable or that your waste company can recycle it. But I would recommend putting them in the uh, in your bin um, just to uh, just in case unless unless you're told otherwise. And then also we've got cans, um, aluminum cans and, and steel cans. And then um, I, I'd say uh, some of the waste companies will also take uh, like milk cartons. And that is, you know, it's paper, but at the same time, it's got a little bit of a, um, a little bit of uh, plastic or wax on it, but that should be recyclable. And then the green organic spin, um, pretty much uh, any kind of food can go in there. So meat, um, egg shells, uh, fruit, um, also um, garden waste uh, like leaves, um, uh, coffee grounds, wood. Um, if you have any um, paper boxes um, that have food uh, residue on them, then those may, uh, again, depending on your waste company, may compost rather than a uh, recycling bin and um, other yard waste like flowers. So for Burtec, um, we have been instructed to put food waste inside our green bin in a separate bag. And, you know, that may differ dep depending on your area, but I would say that that's becoming more standard practice. So if you're collecting food waste for your green bin, first you want to separate it from your trash and recycling. And it's pretty much any kind of food waste you can imagine, uh, fruits, vegetables, edible parts or not, uh, meats, poultry, seafood, bones, uh, brain and, uh, bread and grains, uh, dairy, eggshells, uh, coffee grounds, leftovers, and then any kind of food soiled paper like paper towels, napkins, coffee filters, and, and tea bags. And then you're gonna take that food waste and put it in a plastic bag in a container or not. You can just leave the plastic bag uh, as it is. And then you can store that um, in the kitchen on the countertop or in your refrigerator or freezer or under the sink. I tend to put things in the summer. I tend to put them in the freezer so they don't um, start to uh, decompose and smell too bad. And then in the winter, I might put them uh, in my bin on my balcony. Um, 
Then you want to uh, make sure that uh, the container and or the bag are sealed uh, clo are closed uh, so that you don't get any pest issues. And then the plastic bags that you use, they don't need to be uh, compostable or biodegradable, just pretty much reuse any kind of um, food or shopping bags you already have. Um, and with regard to these uh, compostable and biodegradable bags, yes, they are. They do break down faster than traditional plastic bags. However, it's really not fast enough for either home composting or industrial type composting. So uh, those usually will uh, end up in the landfill, but they will degrade some once they get there. And then the last step is to uh, throw the plastic bag in the green organics bin, making sure that the bag is uh, tied closed. Are there any questions um, on, on separating waste? I don't see anything in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Okay. Um, Sharon, just a um, question. Um, what is your system in uh, Highland? We have the three trash cans, and then we, um, to the city of Highland, were given a little compost, a little um, food waste bin mm -hmm. that we can use. And what do you, what do you, um, is it like a separate bin that you put out on trash no, collection? No, we have to, we have to put it, we have to bag it, just like the demonstration right here on your photo. Okay, okay. Um, what about Apple Valley? I don't know who's from Apple Valley. Is that is that Andrew? Uh, Andrew is. Yeah, Andrew, what do you do in Apple Valley? We don't have composting bins. I home compost. Okay, great. Where where do you compost? On the side of my house, uh, I guess, uh, what is it? Looking at the east side of the house where it's less, less windy. Mm. Um, maybe 15, 20 from the, from the house. That's where I do it. I have three, uh, three large bins in the back. Oh, great. Great. So you'll probably have some uh, information to add <laughs> to this presentation. All I right. thought it was a like a home composting, um, home composting yes. webinar. Basically. Yeah, we're we're getting we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. All right. I'm very much a novice. I moved out here maybe five or six months ago from Irvine, Orange County. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So it's more land, but uh, different conditions, different growing out here. But excited. Trying yeah, to great. great. Good for you. All right. Thank, yeah, you, thank for you for sharing that. that. All right. So um, let's move into home composting. So I can tailor this presentation to your needs. I'm going to add, uh, ask this question. Um, how much composting experience do you have? And you can uh, share it in the chat. Or um, I guess, Andrew, you said you're a novice. Um, how long have you been composting for? Correct. This is my first full year, maybe about four months. OK, great. Um, and Sharon and Bob, how are you doing composting? Oh yeah, we've always done composting. We do vermiposting and we've actually given worms to Highland Given Garden and several different people. Um, but yeah, we've done composting for way back when. <laughs> okay. So all of our like foods, uh, like non-cooked food, um, 
vegetable um, all go in our compost or to our worms or vermipost, one of the two, including coffee grounds and eggshells and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, Great. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob says he's been composting his whole life and he's 70. So, you know, he did it with his dad as a little boy. Wow. That, that was uh, early adoption for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, all right. So, um, yeah, I'll go through some of the basics pretty quickly. Um, so what is composting? Um, it's usually using the natural process of decomposition to turn organic waste into um, a material that's got a lot of nutrients for the garden um, and it's called compost. And so again, organic waste comes from living things and uh, mostly uh, plant material. So it can be grass clippings, food scraps um, or leaves. And we'll go more into that uh, in the next few slides. So um, why is composting important? So I'd like to hear from you. Uh, any, any thoughts here? Well, composting is important because one is getting rid of your garden or vegetable scraps and repurposing them to build more nutrition soil for your for growing more vegetables or more healthy flowers or whatever it is you have in your landscape. Right. It's like the cycle of life. Yep. And you need organic matter in your soil in order to have healthy soil. Right. So I'll put the um, the top uh, top reasons to compost here. So um, first one, um, as as we discussed before, it reduces landfill waste and therefore the greenhouse gas emissions, especially methane that cause climate change. Um, it also decreases the need for chemical fertilizers because there's nutrients uh, in the compost. And if you um, use less chemicals in the soil, then you're gonna get uh, less chemical runoff and that improves water quality. So that's good for the earth. And then um, it improves um, soil properties when added to the soil. So if you have sandy soil, it's gonna help hold some of that water. And if it's clay soil, it'll help it drain. And then um, it can prevent weeds uh, when used as a mulch and also keep moisture in the soil. So it's that magic, uh, magic amendment that you can add to your garden. And there's um, three main uh, ingredients of composting and that's organic materials. Uh, water and air, which has oxygen. And then if you um, properly manage those ingredients and the temperature, um, that speeds up the decomposition process. But um, even if you don't do anything, it's going to uh, break down anyway, but just more slowly. So there are two types of organic materials, browns, which are the high carbon materials. And those include uh, things that are mostly brown, like wood chips, sawdust, uh, leaves, straw, um, shredded newspaper, which is made from trees. And then greens, uh, which are the high nitrogen materials and not, even though they're classified as greens, not all of the greens are actually green in color. So, you know, it could be flowers, or grass clippings, garden trimmings, um, raw fruit and vegetable scraps, um, coffee grounds, which are actually brown, but are considered greens because they're high in nitrogen and crushed eggshells. And then, you know, if you're looking for a list of things that you can put in backyard uh, composting, um, the, the Riverside County Department of Waste Resources has a really nice um, list and talks about um, 
you know, how uh, some precautions for using some of these things, like for instance, it says, if you look at um, say corn stalks, it'll say very slow to decompose or sawdust, don't use painted, treated or artificial lumber. So this is one of the better lists that I've seen and you can find this at rcwaste.org. And then in addition to having all the right materials, um, the organic material doesn't decompose on its own. Um, it needs help from uh, microorganisms, uh, also called microbes, uh, which you can't see, and macroorganisms that you, uh, the bigger creepy crawlies that you can see. And so the microorganisms are mainly bacteria and fungi and they are going to break down those organic materials and are mainly responsible for heating up the compost pile. And then the macroorganisms are things like snails, uh, flies, earthworms, grubs. Um, and some of those things, you don't think of those as being good or things you wanna have uh, in your garden necessarily, but they're really good for your compost. So they're shredding the materials into smaller pieces and uh, then they can be broken down by the microbes and um, the macroorganisms also feed on the microbes. So you need those decomposers for uh, healthy compost. And here are some, here's a generic list of materials to avoid, uh, especially for beginning composters. So you definitely don't wanna put um, your recyclables in there that are not going to break down like plastic, metal, and glass. Um, and you don't want to put anything that has any chemicals in it, like glossy or coated paper or cardboard, uh, treated or painted wood, or diseased or poisonous plants. Um, and also, um, you should try to keep aggressive weeds and grass seeds out of the compost because then when you put the compost uh, in your garden, then they're gonna grow there. Although some of them will be killed by the heat of the, of the compost as you make it. Um, and then the next, um, the next thing is meat and bones, cheese and dairy, cooked food and animal manure. Um, those kind of vary uh, we recommend that you don't uh, put them in when you're for, first starting out because then they can, um, if you're not managing it properly, they can start to smell. However, I do know people that um, use these items like meat and bones. There is a form of composting called bakashi that actually uses, uh, uses meat. Um, and a lot of people do put some animal manure in, but just be, be a little bit sparing with those things and uh, experiment and see what, what works for you. The other thing too is, um, you know, if you're composting in your backyard, you don't wanna be attracting too much uh, wildlife or um, insects that are gonna come into your home. So there are, um, uh, with open air composting, there are two main types, uh, cold and hot. So passive is, or cold composting is basically set it and forget it. So there's little management of the compost pile. You just kind of pile them up, pile up the materials and leave them there. And they're going to break down very slowly. Um, one of the um, negative points of this type of composting is that the wheat seeds and the pathogens are... Um, will survive because they don't have that heat to kill them. Uh, also, it's a long time to finish compost. So it'll eventually break down, but it might take a year or, or more for that to happen. Um, so if you, um, oops, sorry. If you want your compost a little bit faster, then you might wanna do um, uh, active or hot composting. And this is what uh, master gardeners recommend so um, you are gonna have to do some work to manage the conditions. And then uh, you want the temperatures to be uh, 104 degrees 
and above, um, say to 155, 160 max, if it's too high, then that can be killing off those beneficial decomposers. And it's more likely to kill those weed seeds and pathogens, and it's a much shorter time to finish compost, compost. so it'll be uh, months instead of years. And then um, the compost pile goes through different phases as it heats up. So it starts heating up and then the pile will eventually reach a peak temperature as the organic materials break down. Um, and then um, after it stops heating up, after turning it, then it starts to uh, starts to cool down. The decomposition, decomposition is going to slow and stop. And so in that phase, you know, once it's no longer heating up, then allow it to cure for at least uh, four weeks before using and um, maybe a couple, you know, even a couple of months is, is not a bad idea. Um, the thing that you don't want to do is add uh, hot compost to your garden beds because that can that can kill your plants. So you want to make sure that it's done. It's done decomposing. And then, you know, one thing that's really important um, to know, especially as a beginning composter, every time you add material to your compost pile, it goes back into the active phase. So if you do want finished compost, you have to, at some point, stop adding to that pile. And then you may go and just start a new pile. But in order to, to cure, you have to stop adding material. And then, you know, as part of that active management of the pile to really get it to heat up, uh, you want to turn it. So that's exposing the materials and all those decomposers to air so that they can breathe and, and live and do their work. Uh, you also want to release that trapped heat and distribute the moisture and the nutrients and the organisms throughout the pile. And also turning it um, shreds and breaks up the materials and um, I personally like using a pitchfork for this, like a five-tined uh, manure pitchfork, I think works really well. Um, and how often do you need to uh, turn it? Well, once it, you know, once it's really heating up, um, two to three times a week is optimal, but if you don't get to it, um, it just means that it's gonna take a little bit more time to finish compost. It might not get as hot, but you know, it's, um, I'd say the composting process is pretty, pretty forgiving. And you can always, um, you can always modify things uh, to get it going again. And then it's also important that um, the moisture be, um, be correct too, because water is part of the key ingredients in compost. So um, if the pile's too dry, then the microbes are gonna slow down um, their work and they're gonna, gonna start dying. Um, if the pile is too wet, um, then a, not enough air can get in, and it's gonna start to smell. So you wanna keep the pile as moist as a wrung out sponge. So if you, grab a handful of compost and you squeeze it and say, you know, only a drop or two of water comes out. That, that's usually about right. It just, it just should feel uh, moist, not soaking wet. And then for best practices, um, smaller material in general is better. So you want to chop your materials. It'll go, it'll um, break down faster. You want to chop the materials into pieces uh, about half inch to one and a half inches in size. Uh, you can also shred or grind woody material material and leaves, but you have to be careful that it's not um, too fine because then um, uh, the air won't be able to get into the pile. And um, for the size of the pile, you really need a minimum amount of mass for, for it to really heat up. So it's recommended that that be um, three, the pile be about three feet tall by three feet wide by three feet uh, deep for hot composting. Um, if it's smaller, it's, you know, if you don't have room for that, uh, that's fine, but it might not get, a, might not get as hot.
And then uh, one of the most important things is to balance uh, the uh, amount of browns and greens that you have. So there's an optimal carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, by weight, and that's 30 to one. And you could actually uh, calculate that and um, everything that you put in has a carbon to nitrogen ratio and you could figure out what your ratio is for your whole pile, but that's a lot of work. Um, another way to do it is to estimate uh, with equal volumes of browns and greens. Start with that. And then um, if the pile starts to smell, uh, that means you probably need more browns. If the pile is not heating up, that probably means you need more greens. And then you want to use um, coarse browns like um, wood chips or mulch as the base or cover layer. Um, one, one reason is you want to completely bury your food in there and put the food in the middle so that the wildlife doesn't get at it. And also you want that base of coarse brown so you get some drainage from your compost pile. And then when is it ready? Uh, pretty much when it looks like a uh, really dark brown um, soil. So it's gonna be dark brown, it's gonna be crumbly, it's gonna be loose, um, it should smell earthy, it should smell good. Um, and you want the original materials to have fully broken down. So you don't wanna see any apple cores or banana peels in there. And then the pile is gonna shrink quite a bit to about a third of its initial size. So you can put quite a bit of uh, waste in a pile. And then there are two easy ways to tell uh, whether uh, compost is ready. One is the bag test. So you take a, a bit of um, moist compost and you put it in a Ziploc bag and keep it there for a couple of days. And then um, if it doesn't smell bad when you open the bag, it, it's probably ready. And then also you can do a germination test where you're gonna plant seeds in the compost and you're gonna water it and see what comes up. Um, and you could compare that with a uh, commercial soil mix. So you should be able to grow things uh, in your compost. And then um, there are several different ways you can use to, um, you can use compost. So um, you can add it to the soil as an amendment. And um, the great thing about that is it's gonna improve your soil health uh, it's going to add a lot of nutrients. It's going to um, help your water holding capacity, whether you have sandy soil or clay soil. So for that, you're just going to mix in a two inch layer of compost in the top four to six inches of garden soil. Uh, you can also use uh, compost as a mulch, and that's going to keep the soil moist and prevent weeds. Um, and you're just gonna spread a one to four inch layer of compost around your plants and trees, but you wanna keep that, uh, keep that a, at least a foot away from tree trunks and away from uh, stems uh, because it can cause rot. And then also you can add compost to potting soil for either indoor or outdoor plants. Um, so you can use it for um, planting in containers you know, with, with potting soil. And then um, if you um, if the pieces are too big in your compost, you might want to run them through a screen uh, to remove those pieces. And then for composting systems, uh, there's almost uh, as many systems out there as there are composters. There's something for everybody, and it really depends on what your preference is and what your situation is. Um, if you are, you know, in your, if you're uh, out on the farm, you may see something like the open pile, a really, really big open pile. Uh, you can do open piles uh, at home as well. Um, but again, make sure that, you know, they're either um, covered with um, browns or you could even put a tarp on top to protect them. And then um, you, there are different kinds of bins. So you can have like a closed plastic bin, which is more of an anaerobic type of composting. You can have uh, open plastic or wire bins. Uh, this one here, the open plastic bin is called a geo bin. And it pretty much mimics what the wire does. 
uh, but probably a little bit more um, um, may last longer, uh, easier to use. And then uh, you can use a tumbler. I, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about the tumblers. Uh, most of them are not quite big enough to really get the compost to heat up. They are really easy to turn. So that that's the, uh, the pros. Um, the negative part is that um, it's best when um, compost can touch the ground because then you're gonna get those decomposers uh, crawling up into the compost uh, to get it to decompose. Uh, but with a tumbler, you don't really have that. So you may wanna put some soil in there to get some, some of those um, macro and microorganisms into your compost. Um, and then there's worm bins where the worms are the primary decomposers. And that's a whole uh, another subject for a future class. And then there are um, multiple bin systems. So you can have one like this wooden wire system that has uh, several uh, different compartments or it, so it can be totally enclosed or it can be open like this con concrete block system. And that just allows you to have several different, um, different piles going at once and they can be um, different at different stages uh, in uh, decomposition. And then also, um, if you have more money than time, or you know, depending on what your situation is, um, you might want to use a high tech solution. So they have these industrial type solutions. You could actually put this, say, in a um, school kitchen where all the waste goes into it, and then a few days later you get finished compost. Or this is the one on the right. This white one is called a Lomi. And that's kind of a tabletop um, system that you can use at, at home. And again, it's the same thing that you don't have to go through this long composting process. You just kind of put it in there and a few days later you get that finished compost. Um, however, you, you, know, you end up paying for, for that. And then composting tools. Uh, composting is a really simple process. You don't have to have anything fancy, uh, pretty much just something to turn your compost with and a source of water. But you know, when you're first starting out, you may want to invest in a uh, compost thermometer and it's got a really long stem on it. You can get these on Amazon. Uh, they used to cost about $25. I don't know what they are now, maybe 30. Um, and it's just nice uh, to uh, be able to see, you know, how your compost is heating up, but it's, it's not necessarily necessary. You can put your hand uh, in the compost uh, very carefully in case it's really, really hot, or you can see the steam rising from it. Um, also, you know, if you are a numbers person, you might want to get a scale uh, so that you can weigh everything that you're putting in your compost pile to know how much your how much organic waste you're keeping out of the landfill. Um, you might want to have a notebook or a binder where you're keeping all the stats on your on your compost piles. Uh, you definitely want to have a source of water, so a garden hose and a, a nozzle. Um, and then you'll have your shovels and pitchforks. Uh, you might want to have loppers and shears handy in case you need to cut. Uh, cut some of your materials down, a wheelbarrow if you're moving um, larger quantities of material, and then you could have covered buckets or bins where you're putting your material that will uh, be transferred, say your greens and your browns that are going to be transferred to your compost pile on a regular basis. So in summary, um, composting helps the environment because it's recycling the organic waste and keeping it out of the landfill and uh, preventing methane uh, gas from accumulating. Um, compost improves soil, it decreases fertilizer use and prevents weeds and uh, retains moisture when used as a mulch. Um, and the basic ingredients of compost are the organic material, the browns and the greens, the water and the air. And um, the benefit to hot composting is it makes compost faster and is more likely to kill uh, wheat seeds and pathogens. And then just make sure that you uh, fully cure um, and test your compost before use. 
So are there any questions on home composting at this point or comments? Now, I know uh, sow bugs can kind of help with compost because I know that they eat some of the organic matter, but at the same time that their waste that they leave behind really helps to enrich it. Um, what is that? I'm sorry, I missed the first the, word. The sow bugs. Oh, sow bugs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was one thing that you didn't have listed as insects that help build soil. Yeah, good, good, good point. There are so many, but yes. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, yeah. Just a little fun fact sort of thing. Um, back when the last recession was here in, in our neighborhood, it really was declined. And we had like 19 empty houses in a, in a, in a square block. Um, and so Bob and I, because we really wanted to make a lot of compost, because when you make compost, it's, you know, ends up being free soil. Um, we went around to several of the empty houses and raked up all their, their leaves and took them home. Oh, bless you. <laughs> Good for you. That's what I said. And, and Bob, when he worked for the school district, used to bring home bags and bags of, of leaves from, from the ground workers, you know, raking up and, you know, having all the, the compost, you know, all the leaves they're just going to get rid of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of depends like where you're at, because, you know, if you're up in the mountains, then you may actually, you know, you may have way more browns than you do greens. True, very true. So sometimes, you know, you have to like <laughs> stockpile, especially yeah. in the summer, stockpile the browns <laughs> yeah. from the winter. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have to be inventive here. My wife and I catch the leaves from my neighbor's cottonwood tree in the wind. Good for you. Yeah, yeah. I know people in the people in the mountains have a hard time um, getting the materials that they need <laughs> in the desert as well. I, I imagine you probably have a hard time getting. You might have a hard time getting green sometimes. Um, lots of trees, but you're right, leaves and grass are tough to get. Now, if you have any, like, coffee shops or, like, juice bars, you can go in and ask if they give away their left, you know, their, what do you call it, their waste. Yes, and absolutely. We, we, used to, we used to do that. We used to go out to a juice bar and uh, get theirs and, and that went directly to our worms because, you know, it was already mostly broken down and they could, you know, worms could digest it really quick. Yeah, I know that Starbucks is pretty good about giving away, um, giving away uh, coffee grounds. Yeah, and you just go in, you know, and, and they'll even have where they'll say this day, it's this person, this day, it's that person or whatever. But yeah, it really helps if you're struggling to have enough material. Yeah, I think the juice bars are definitely, definitely a plus for getting those greens. Yeah. The, the only thing like with, with Starbucks, they'll actually like save them for you. Like if you say, okay, I'm gonna give you this big tote at the beginning of the week, this big container. And I'm going to come back, you know, in a few days, they'll have it filled for you. But yeah. I tried that with a juice bar and they ended up getting a lot of mats <laughs> inside the store and they had to stop. It's like, we can't save it. We cannot save it inside the store. And then they tried saving it outside the store and someone stole the container. <laughs> uh, well, for us, when we used to go to the juice bar, we, they would, um, we would just be, we're going to be here on Wednesday and they just save it for Wednesday. Yeah. So it would be just that day so you wouldn't have the gnat issue or, or fruit fry issue happening. 
Yeah, they can also like if it happens to be the time that they're cleaning out their machines, they might say, oh, yeah, come back at two, you know, because we right. clean out like twice a day or every hour or whatever it happens to be. So yeah. and um, I think, too, you know, like a lot of restaurants now, you know, now that they have to pay to have their um, organic waste taken away. Uh, sometimes they they can be pretty generous. So like if you can find a vegetarian restaurant. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, now I know, I realize it's five o'clock, so I'm gonna try to get through this get through this quick. This is the new information um, that I've added to the presentation. Um, and I think, uh, Sharon, this is definitely going to be relevant for you if you have not heard this already. But oh, I'm I'm really up on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I did talk to um, the CDFA specifically about this. Um, so anyway, okay. So um, let's talk about um, how to compost safely in a quarantine area. And this is all the information that I could glean from actually talking to a specialist at the CDFA. And there isn't much, to be honest, there isn't that much information uh, about this topic out there that's written down. So uh, let's talk about the background. So the quarantine area in Southern California now is um, covers San Bernardino and Riverside counties um, and just specific areas of those counties. So again, Redlands, Yucaipa, Highland, San Bernardino, Riverside, and more. And I'll show the map in the next uh, in the next slide. And then uh, this is a pest that attacks uh, over 230 crops in California. So it could be anything from apples, avocados, um, all kinds of fruits, fruits and vegetables, citrus, um, even tomatoes, and also nuts like walnut. And it has a really short life cycle, so it spreads very quickly and also has um, caused a lot of economic losses uh, to the uh, um, commercial growers because of damaged fruit. Um, they have to increase their pesticide use, which is not good for the earth either. And also there's export restrictions. You can't move the fruit out of fruit and vegetables out of the area. So um, it's already widespread throughout um, Southern Asia and Hawaii. And it was first found in California in 1960 and it's been um, reintroduced every year since 1966. However, um, it um, is not considered, the oriental fruit fly is not considered to be permanently established here uh, because of all the efforts may have, that have been made to eradicate it. So just keep in mind, uh, we are currently in the midst of uh, the worst exotic fruit fly uh, infestation uh, in uh, California history. So this is something we really need to be very serious about. So this is the quarantine map and the CDFA um, updates this map uh, frequently. The last update was at the end, uh, near the end of December. And you can see it goes um, almost to uh, crest line all the way down uh, in the north to uh, Moreno Valley in the south and then uh, west of Riverside and then east of Yucaipa. So, and it's expanding um, as we speak. So um, yeah, the, the, this map is available on the CDFA website uh, so that you can uh, check it just to see, see where you are uh, in relation to the quarantine. And I'm in Rancho Cucamonga, so it's uh, it's heading my it's heading my way, and already looks like it's pretty close to Fontana. All right, so CDFA has a pest profile just to give you an idea of what um, what the fly looks like. So it looks to me like kind of a cross between a bee or a wasp and a fly. So it's a little bit larger than a house fly, but still only uh, less than half half an inch long. 
Um, and the body color, um, it's got several different colors to it, but it's got like a bright yellow with a dark uh, T shape marking on the abdomen. The wings are clear and you can, uh, the, you can see the difference between the female and the male. Uh, the female has this ovipositor on the abdomen that's used to deposit the eggs uh, into fruit and the eggs are laid in batches. They're very small and hard to see. Um, and the larvae are, uh, are white and they look, they look kind of like worms or grubs. So this shows the uh, oriental uh, fruit fly life cycle and um, shows the reason why um, the fruit fly can infest new areas so quickly. So if we start in the upper right with the eggs, so the females are gonna lay those eggs under the skin of the host fruit. And then within only a day or two, uh, the larva hatch, and then they're going to feed on the pulp of the fruit. And then they're going to, in order to turn into adults, uh, they actually, um, they emerge from the fruit and then they, um, they, they drop from the fruit and burrow into the soil to pupate. And that's when they become adults. So from larva to uh, pupating the soil is about seven to 12 days. And then um, to become adults, uh, 10 to 12 days, and then only eight to 12 days till they're ready to lay eggs again. So it, you know, if you add all that up, it's only a little bit more than a month, you can go through the whole life cycle. And the interesting thing is that the adults only live about three months, but they can fly pretty far, they can fly up to 30 miles to uh, feed and lay eggs. And that's how that's how it spreads and how uh, quickly you can get several life cycles of, of the fly, if you're not uh, careful. And so um, the standard treatment um, for oriental flute, uh, fruit fly is the male attractant technique uh, called MAT. And um, when, a, when the fruit fly is found, then um, small bait stations are applied to utility poles and street trees in a one and a half mile radius from that site. And those bait stations contain a male attractant mixed with pesticides. And so the males die and the females are unable to mate and um, that uh, pretty much kills the population. Um, the great thing about these bait stations is that um, they don't do harm to other insects like bees and butterflies. However, um, there might be additional um, spray pesticide treatment that's needed uh, to stop the spread. So if you see trucks putting these bait stations around your area, you will uh, understand what that's all about. So on their website, um, the CDFA um, gives some guidance for uh, people who are growing fruits and vegetables in their property. And so um, the recommendation is to not move any uh, homegrown fruits and vegetables from your property if you're uh, in the quarantine area. Um, you can eat or process the food on your property. So by process that, you know, that can mean making juice, freezing it, cooking it, or even uh, putting it down the garbage disposal. Um, and then if you do want to dispose of any homegrown produce, uh, double bag it in plastic and then put it in the black trash bin for the landfill for collection. Don't put it in the green bin because then it will be taken off the property and turned uh, into compost. And uh, we don't want that to happen because that can spread the fly. So... Um, if you do have questions or suspect you have uh, an infestation, you can call the CDFA pest hotline. And I did call them to get more information about composting, 
And a specialist uh, did call me back within a couple of days. This was over the uh, Christmas holidays. So, um, and they can, like, if they will send somebody to your home if you think you have an infestation or they can answer any questions. So I would recommend uh, giving them a call. And so I think the um, guidance for gardeners and um, people who grow uh, produce on their property is pretty straightforward. Um, when it comes to composting, it's a little more subtle and it's really about trying to reduce risk. So you want to try to compost as safely as possible. And uh, I have not heard anything that says, um, at least from the CDFA, the person I talked to about not composting at all, um, but they're, they're saying um, follow safe composting practices. And that means using the hot composting method because when you're um, Maintaining that pile, turning it, watering it, it's heating up and that's going to kill the fly larva. Um, also, you know, as you normally would, bury your produce deep within the pile and that's going to prevent um, flies from feeding on that produce or um, uh, depositing eggs into the produce. And then you wanna cover the pile completely with browns, just as you normally would. So wood chips or mulch. And then if you want extra protection, uh, cover the pile with a tarp, or you could use a closed system that's completely enclosed like that plastic bin uh, that I showed in the previous slide. And then, um, you know, if you're in the quarantine area, just keep a lookout for those flies in your pile or on your property. Um, if you want to be really safe and cut down on the risk as much as possible, then um, you should avoid adding produce that's on the host list. So there is a host list on the on the website, and we'll provide that that link um, because um, green material alone, or you know, fruits and vegetables that are not on that list, are not going to attract the fly. And then one thing to be aware of, if you do find flies you know, on your property, composting is a higher risk uh, because you know that the flies are there. So um, that is, uh, it's really just kind of uh, um, trying to minimize the risk as, as much as possible. And then, um, as for resources, Sharon's gonna put these uh, links in the chat. Um, there's the Oriental Fruit Fly Fact Sheet, the um, Pest Profile, the Regulation and Quarantine Boundaries, the Plant Host List, and then the information for residents is pretty much um, the information that was on the slide about, about gardening in a quarantine area. So all those are on the CDFA website, cdfa.ca.gov. Uh, are there any questions at this point about Oriental Fruit Fly or any comments? The only thing I think I have is, is that um, I've been watching it since I heard, first heard about it and been watching the area map grow. And I'm just really hoping it doesn't get as bad as Mediterranean fruit fly did several years ago when they went through and did the aerial spraying with the malathion. Um, yeah. Because that was horrible. Um, but I do know that they are currently coming into properties, home properties that they have found um, the fruit fly at. And if there's any fruit on the trees, they're they're actually physically stripping the fruit off and they're recommending that if, if, a, if one is found in, on your, on your trees that, or, you know, that you strip off the fruit and, and dispose of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I've definitely heard that um, you should not, you know, if fruit falls on the ground, you should pick it up, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. What makes me really sad is, is, we're finally out of the citrus uh, greening 
quarantine in my area, but now we're in the Oriental fruit fry quarantine. <laughs> mm -hmm. So all of our citrus, you know, we can't really do anything with. Yeah. Well, I guess you're going to be eating a lot of uh, citrus. Your oh, own we citrus. have we have so many lemons <laughs> right now. It's not even funny. I guess you're going to be making a lot of jam or something. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you are a fly find site, the, the CDFA actually comes in and takes the fruit off for you or they tell you to take it off or both? I think it's both. I think it just depends upon how much they have found on your property. And if they come and you have a lot of of um of fruit still around on your trees or whatever I think they will actually help you strip it do they um are you allowed to use it or do they make you um throw it away I think that if it is found on your trees they don't let you use it I think they're act actually disposing of it okay because just the risk of even like having your peels around afterwards or whatever, I think, yeah. that, you know, because then how you get rid of those peels with when larvae are going to be actively being present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So um, let's finish up here. Um, so just letting you know that we've got um, composting resources on the Master Gardener website. Um, if you go um, to the main page on the left-hand side menu, if you go to recent presentations, uh, this presentation will be up there within the next week. Um, also, we have resource sheets uh, on composting and uh, links to videos on our YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel is UCCE San Bernardino. Um, and this presentation will be also up there shortly. And there's other, um, other gardening and composting presentations there. And just letting you know that Master Gardeners are here to help. Uh, so you can call or email our helpline at any time with your garden questions and somebody will get back to you shortly. And then, um, in person, uh, we have an information table and also our seed library at the Highland Library the second Saturday of the month, uh, 11 to 1. And then also, if you have a question, we have Ask a Master Gardener time the second Sunday of the month. Um, from 11 to 1. And there's you'll see a link on the website to register for that. And then I just want to thank you for attending. And uh, if you have any questions for me or questions about composting, uh, you can send them to my email address, uh, dschnoor at ucanr.edu or our uh, Master Gardener Helpline. And they can always, uh, they will always contact me as well. So um, any questions? Um, on oriental fruit fly or anything about composting or recycling before we end. I think you did a really good job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate your expertise and thanks for coming, Andrew. I hope I, hope I uh, helped you. Yeah, same here. I look forward to attending one of the seed bank giveaways. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. We'll stop recording.